The, and I want to come back to the Belgian Congo because it's a really important one. So typically, the, you know, that's the first one I get. Okay, so so there's there's a really important thing to keep in mind. Okay, which is the Congo Free State, which is the subject of King Leopold's Ghost, the Adam Hochschild book, was not a colony. Okay, it was a private rubber estate owned by and operated by the King of Belgium. It had no relationship to the government of Belgium. It had no relationship to the Belgian state. Indeed, its whole premise was, we can colonize this area and run it without government, okay? So, to, and, 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 and uh, Hochschild is disingenuous when he gave the subtitle to that book, A Tale of Greed and Horror in Colonial Africa, because this was not a colony, okay? But the, it, and it's not just a technicality, right? And I'll come back to this. Belgian colonial rule in the Congo began in 1908 in response mm -hmm. to the failures of the Congo Free State, okay? And once the Belgians colonized the Congo, it experienced 45 years in which the only 45 years in the history of the Congo that have actually been successful. There were paved roads, there were food supply, there was good governance, there was beginnings of democracy. So Belgian rule in the Congo, 1908 to 1955, incredibly successful. King Leopold's free state was not a colony, okay? It was a private run enterprise. Now, that is exactly the case for colonialism. The case for colonialism, you need accountability mechanisms operating through a state accountable to a liberal government back home. The free state didn't have that, right? So it was the poster child for colonialism, not the poster child against colonialism. It was precisely the argument because absent colonialism, what would have been in these places? Well, you think of them having multi-ethnic barbecues and, and you know, paid uh, gender neutral bathrooms? No, they'd have, they'd have horrific slaving. Uh, and don't forget all those violent rubber harvesting operations were long preceded King, King of Kong, um, the Congo Free State, right? They came in from the East, right? They were the Arab slave traders. Uh, and they're famous. Tipo Tip is the most famous brutal rubber harvester who was a, an Arab slave trader and kind of on again, off again ally of, of, of King Leopold. Now, King Leopold doesn't go in there. That place is run by Arab slave traders and rubber harvesters. And believe me, it's going to start making the Congo Free State look relatively benign, especially oh, because Congo Free State had media in there and lawyers and missionaries calling out every so, single abuse that they it? found. So, so why is it that whenever you look in the literature, I, I understand the argument. I, I think it's, it's a good argument. Why is it that whenever you look in the, the documents, right, these colonizers, the colonial rulers, whatever body is in charge, you always see them discussing their subjects in a manner that seems to be very dehumanizing. I mean, obviously, because all people's Bengali, all people's talked about other people's in the manner that we would consider dehumanizing today. The Chinese talked about the Japanese in dehumanizing. Well, the British way. really the hate Maori. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, that, it, that, it's that, just that. it's 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 the it's the way humans experienced others. And don't forget, this is a time when we don't have you know we don't have TV, we don't have rapid air travel, we don't have international travel, we don't have multicultural societies. People are still coming out of what's essentially a, a feudal type of social structure where, where in-group solidarity is key, right? And every group was racist, if you want to use that term, right? So to, to say, oh, oh, Colonel Blimp was a racist towards the blacks in Africa was totally anachronistic because it's either just true by definition, everyone was a racist back there, yeah. or it's not true because comparatively speaking, you know, they came in with, with, with people. One of the problems with colonial officials, of course, is that they, they all went native, right? They all became kind of proponents of the places they were ruling and, and lost touch with their responsibilities to the home government. Uh, so I it just, it's, it's yes. And, and don't forget, where did those documents come from, right? They were produced by colonial governments. They were produced by, by media from these colonial states. I mean, we don't have documents and books on Tipo Tip's horrific slave state in Eastern Congo. Why? Because Arab cultures and Arab slave states didn't produce documents. They didn't have parliamentary yeah. inquiries. They didn't have a free press. They didn't have civil society. So what are we, so <laughs> it's just kind of a, we call this, we call this an archives finish, right? It's like, oh, I, I, I spend all my time in the archives and I read all these offensive things and oh my God. But that, but that's not a full picture of the state of the world at the time, right?